So hi, I'm Swan Abasi. I'm going to be giving a presentation about real-time anomaly detection and root cause analysis, specifically about stuff that we do here at Yoda Scale. And so I'll kind of talk about the subject matter broadly. Um, I guess before, just to kind of get a sense of uh, kind of who's in the audience, except for if, unless I know you, but the folks that I don't know, like how many people are in ops? Engineers? Uh, what students? Wait, 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 how about you? What do you what, what do you do? You can call me product manager. Kind product of manager. Project manager. Okay. Product. We also product. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So anyway, so I just want to kind of get a feel for for the room. So I will kind of get technical, not super technical. I'll throw a couple equations on the board to seem smart. Um, but anyway, so that's the topic. A little bit about me. I'm the CTO of VPE here. Um, at, at Yoda Scale. I was at Google uh, for a number of years. Uh, most recently, I was running the development experience for GCP. So everything from the workflow and the SDK uh, runtimes. Uh, but critically for this role, I was also in charge of the diagnostics effort. So things like error reporting and distributed trace and uh, debug. Uh, before that, I was in payments uh, at Google. And before that, I was at PayPal. Uh, for many years, thus the kind of the PayPal folks that are here, uh, and before that, I was once upon a time uh, an engineer uh, at eBay. So the agenda today, I'm going to be talking about ops, right? I mean, really, kind of uh, what what Yoda Scale does is really enable ops teams to run more effectively. So I will be kind of going into kind of what makes a great ops team. We'll talk about some of the things that I le uh, learned from. Uh, Google along the way, uh, talk about the stuff that we're doing here at Yoda Scale and, and you know, ultimately kind of providing a deep dive about into anomaly detection and root cause. And I have my obligatory Homer, Homer slide. So what do great ops teams do, right? Great ops teams think long term, right? They're thinking strategically. Um, and they have a lot of things to kind of keep keep in mind, right, as they're, as they're thinking about their jobs and their environments, they have to think about availability, they have to think about performance, they have costs, they have capacity planning, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that, that they have to kind of manage while they're fi fighting fires, right, so there's going to be always kind of the, the, the issue at hand, and there's always going to be uh, critical pages and alerts that you have to deal with, and so you have to kind of balance the strategic and the tactical. So, at the same time, with the shift to cloud, right, I mean, in, in enterprise context especially, uh, they've gotten pretty good at their jobs, they understand their environments, they understand what's going, uh, they have decades of experience in terms of the process and, like, you know, how do they pro do pro procurement, how do they do accounting, like, how do they deal with CapEx, all those processes are, are, are in place, but at, with the shift to cloud, they have a whole new set of uh, demands, right, they have a whole new set of complexities to deal with, uh, they have to get new terms, right? I mean, they've got uh, all sorts of t uh, TLAs that, they, that you've got to learn because of AWS, GCP. Azure, at least, is not a TLA. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's all kind of new, brand new ways of, of dealing with all of this stuff. And you have thousands of cloud features that you have to keep up with, new things getting announced, um, you know, almost every week, right? Every, uh, all of the different cloud providers are the same if you squint, but if you actually look kind of a little bit under the cover, they're actually remarkably different. Um, you know, it's different ways of deploying. Um, you know, there's just a lot of complexity that, that you have to uh, have to work work through. So, a lot of these this complexity, just kind of, I was th just reflecting on this that the demands are actually very similar to the things that that Google was actually facing, right? So, Google is kind of considered cloud native. A lot of these concepts that are now uh, du jour, right? Kind of the things that people talk about um, actually originated at Google. Um, so, you know, just kind of taking a step back of like, you know, how does Google handle this ops problem and deal with the same complexity that I was describing over here? All of it, actually, I mean, they're, you don't, maybe you're not dealing with multiple clouds, but certainly you got different, different uh, environments and different, uh, um, you know, versions of kind of capabilities of, of, of your application platform that you'll be dealing with, different stacks. So a lot of the same complexity um, is happening there, and, but Google's been kind of dealing with it in a very different way for the last probably since the beginning, 1998. I mean, I was there since 2011. A lot of the stuff was already embedded, but kind of continued to evolve. The shift to cloud happened while I was there. And so a lot of these, a lot of these practices are getting externalized, and we're seeing that uh, in tooling like Kubernetes and, and the like, that, that's, that's getting uh, externalized. Um, so there's some, some basic principles that Google uses to manage at scale, like manage this complexity at scale, right? So the first is humans 
are always in the loop, right? So this notion that you know machines will kind of take over the world and you know everything will be automated. It's great as an aspirational statement, and that's where Google wants to be. But the reality is humans, domain experts, subject matter experts you are, are still required in order to do the automation. New systems are always being launched. They have different characteristics. They have different demands. And so you need the human in the loop to understand that context and kind of build, build, up, uh, build that up. You know, there's a lot of pressures coming in modern, modern enterprises, right? And there's a lot of demands to, to decentralize. Google, so last time I heard, I think it was like 100,000 people at Google, right? I mean, a huge company running in kind of like a different uh, organizations called product areas, like think YouTube, ads, search, right? I mean, these are different product areas. They're actually run pretty much decentralized. They have their own, uh, you know, product management. They even have, to some extent, their own infrastructure of how they, how they work. But there's certain capabilities that are built in. They come built in as part of the stack, right? And so that governance of all of the things around privacy and security and, you know, deployments and builds, all of that, all of those capabilities are actually quote unquote centralized because there's a common stack that's using it, doing it. But there's not a human gatekeeper that says, hey, you're not allowed to launch, you know, sitting in ads where the person doesn't have context in search, right? Or there's some team in, in core infrastructure that decides that like, you know, hey, you're, you're working on the wrong stack. The way that it's, it's enforced is actually in the code base, making sure that those application frameworks have those capabilities. It's the fastest way to run. So it's almost by, it's by default that software engineers are incented to use that common stack because it's just the fastest way to go. I'm not gonna have to go solve the kind of all of the different complexity around security and all the compliance things I have to go do if you build on the stack. But you can, if you wanna do something different, you think your use case doesn't require it, go knock yourself out. You can use the use the platform where uh, where it's needed, um, and there will still be checks, like in terms of like how you manage your environment and the configuration that will still be enforced at the point that you're checking things in, and there will be build rules and the like. Uh, and that's really how how Google is able to scale the process. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, kind of checks in, in in the software stack that actually help help with decentralization. This is the thing that I think I want to kind of just emphasize a lot of enterprises actually get wrong, right? When they're thinking about decentralization, I mean, it's often a pendulum, right? I mean, I worked at uh, a number of companies where they would kind of have this thing where, hey, we're moving too slowly, right? We have these gatekeepers and they're blocking us. We have central architecture teams and we have central ops teams and they're blocking uh, our pushes, so we're moving too slow. Okay, let's go decentralize. And then we're like, whoa, it's like a like wild west. Now we can't enforce things. And like, you know, like now, uh, now it's becoming too hard to control what's happening and get visibility. Let's go back to centralized, right? And this pendulum that happens in, in companies because they're, they're solving the problem at the wrong, wrong layer. I mean, a lot of this is culture, uh, but a lot of this is just kind of like thinking about kind of the, the punchline here is that ops is a software problem, right? And how do you actually solve these things through software? It's kind of just embedded as part of Google's culture. Um, the other thing is like automate last, last year's job away, right? So for kind of central to uh, ops being a software problem is really what you're trying to do is, is automate, 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 right? And, and so as you're thinking about being strategic, you have a lot of things that you gotta do in terms of automation, but you're fighting fires, right? And so there's always this balance of like, how do you spend enough time to kind of go and automate when you've got this kind of this site? This huge site of hundreds of thousands of nodes with services that are all talking to each other. It's really, really hard. So what the SRA team did is just say, hey, look, we're just going to reserve 50% of our capacity uh, to say we're going to be working on projects. And these projects are those strategic concerns I talked about, right? Availability and uh, um, performance and visibility, monitoring, right? How did the, how did the stuff get, get enforced in the stack? Because if they actually reserved time, that they learned the lessons from what went wrong and brought it back into, into the software stack. So that's kind of that takes a certain amount of discipline and it also takes a certain amount of capacity, right? You have to have capacity in your operations team to say that you're going to be reserving 50% just to work on these long-range projects. So ultimately, what's the lesson from Google? You've got to automate. Automate all the things. But how? Right? That's the hard part. Talked about how you have to reserve uh, reserve uh, cycles, but there's going to be some pragmatic limits that you reach, right? You can automate, automate, automate. There's going to be some limits. So when you actually think about overall, like you know, kind of that journey that that companies go through when they're starting to automate their system, right? And this is based on my experience, and it probably will resonate with a lot of you in terms of you think about kind of 
especially if you've worked at larger companies that have kind of gone through some pain um, of like, hey, things aren't going well, and you know, you're trying to kind of grow, and there's a lot of demand. Um, you know, the first thing that you really try to get a handle on is your deployments, right? Your, your, your push. And so, you know, that's what I consider kind of level one level automation. Um, you know, you're just trying to kind of be deterministic. Uh, I will kind of share, share a story. I don't want to, uh, you know, back in my day, I was there actually, so I, I can kind of share the blame. Uh, it's like, you know, I was at PayPal and it would generally like push, push cycles were from the time that you did a cut to the time that you released was about four to six weeks, right? I think the target was four weeks if I recall correctly. And we got, you know, that, we hit that four weeks about 50% of the time. Right? It was just really hard to be kind of like there's, you had so many code changes coming in, lots of features coming in. That four weeks was reserved for testing, right? And there'd be bugs, and then you'd have to kind of, kind of uh, push, push into it, um, you know, kind of mer merge in, and there were errors, and you would have to go back and, and retest. So we would always end up missing that, that, that four weeks. I mean, for a while there, I think there was like probably a two-year time period where we never hit the four weeks, right? Um, and nowadays, I mean, you think about that, that kind of sounds like crazy, right? Because people are pushing like daily and like hourly, right? And this was like, you know, this was about 2005, 2006, right? It was a long time ago, but it was kind of the first thing that you're like, oh, we got to get better at this. We got to be able to push. Uh, I mean, and so, so there's a set of techniques that you use, right? To kind of go full CI, CD, uh, you know, make sure that you had good test automation, right? Automate, automated provisioning, automated rollbacks, right? There's a set of techniques that you can do to actually get, the, get this done. The second level of automation comes from being metrics focused, right? Really thinking about what's actually happening out there, right? That visibility of like, hey, once you deploy, how's my site, right? What's going on? So you have, like, you want monitoring, you want logging, you want alerting. So, you know, kind of, these things can happen kind of concurrently, but I'm just saying kind of from a graduate, you know, as you graduate, um, you're really kind of getting better. You eventually want it to be tying kind of how the health of the system back to, um, back to business KPIs, right? And so, again, at PayPal, we could actually tell you that, hey, this outage, we were down for this much time, and this was the dollars lost, right? And it was similar, like, you know, at Google, you could say, this, uh, this system was down and like, you know, ad revenue lost, right? And so, so you can kind of, the moment that you can kind of get good enough in terms of tying kind of what's happening, your availability back to kind of business metrics and kind of uh, even latency, right? I mean, kind of latency increases and like the number of searches decrease, right? I mean, everybody knew the, the, those, those metrics at Google, right? I mean, like literally like the, if the search, search latency increases by a couple hundred milliseconds, like how, how, many, how, what, how many fewer searches are happening. And by the way, there's a kind of direct correlation to ad revenue on that as well, right? Um, so, you know, you can kind of do level one and level two on-prem, right? This was, uh, these were kind of problems that the industry was solving, I would say, kind of like in the 2000s, right? 2005 to 2010. Um, and, you know, the, as AWS started kind of catching fire, there were kind of a new set of pain points that started happening, right? Um, and so the next level is like, okay, people are starting to go to, go to cloud. And what you find right, uh, what I've heard kind of uh, anecdotally and kind of even witnessed it at Google is just that pain that people have when they go from on-prem to kind of a traditional lift and shift, like, hey, we're gonna run the same application that we were running on-prem in the cloud, and it's all of a sudden, all of the kind of the magic and the promise of cloud, which is like, hey, more flexibility, and it's cheaper, and, you know, it's more available, and blah, 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 all that goes out the window, because. It's not cheaper, right? That's kind of a giant lie. Because like, if you lift and shift, it's actually going to be way more expensive because you're paying like not only the cost of that hardware, but there's this premium that you know AWS is going to char charge and GCP is going to charge. Um, that's actually pretty expensive, right? And so you often, and then there's a whole new set of pain points, right? That flexibility comes at a cost, uh, which which we talked about, right? And so so often we, there's these boomerang companies, right? You got this enterprise company. They get the CIO that's kind of went to the conference and heard the new buzzword that everybody must be in the cloud. They come back and they say, hey, I, you know, we need to be in the cloud, right? Because all my peers are in the cloud and I don't want to be left behind. And so then you got teams that are scrambling to kind of figure out how they're doing it. And, you know, it's like, whoa, costs are skyrocketing and we can't control, control what's going on. We've lost governance. We've lost control. Um, and so you got boomerangs coming back, right? You try it. You're like, wow, that was, that was painful. I like my kind of familiar... Uh, uh, you know, on-prem world that, you know, we have two decades of experience, we know how to manage. Now, there's certain companies that have kind of embraced the cloud and they have a set, and, and they know how to do, they have techniques that they've developed, right? I mean, kind of a canonical example is generally Netflix, right? So Netflix did this transition from going on-prem 
to AWS. They were one of the first. They just went and jumped in with both feet. They felt the same exact pain as everybody else, right? But they just said, hey, we're going to fix forward, right? And there's a whole bunch of techniques that they developed along the way that are kind of cloud native, uh, kind, of, kind of considered cloud native. And so there's things like, hey, we're going to be using microservices. We're going to use containers. We're going to be able to pack these containers into kind of much more densely on these VMs. So, that, you know, why is the cost coming? Well, you lifted and shifted. You weren't using your, your uh, um, resources uh, as effectively as you could. Um, Move to containers, right? Move to uh, move to uh, things like Terraform, so you can actually spin up environments and tear them down quickly. Um, you know, start using service meshes so that you know you have a bunch of micro microservices and how do you manage them and how do you actually uh, stitch them together? So you have you know Amazon API gateways and, and Kong. So there's a set of kind of techniques like microservices and containers that you, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that you have to actually be using in order to be using the cloud effectively, right? If you're not, if you're kind of thinking of in the old, in the way that kind of traditional applications were written, um, it's going to be, you know, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt, and you're going to be one of these boomerang companies. You're still going to end up in the cloud. You're just going to be kind of like, you know, jump in and jump back out. You're going to kind of like, it'll be a little bit slower journey for you. Um, so, you know, let's say that you kind of graduate from this, right? You say, hey, look, like, you know, I, I, I've containerized all my applications. I've moved to microservices. I've kind of used, I'm using service mesh and kind of all the, all, all the latest stuff. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay, right? And this is, there's a ton of companies that are kind of comfortable in the cloud. And like, you know, most of startups that kind of like, that they're starting up now, right? They're, they grew up in the cloud, so they're doing all of this stuff. Um, they say, hey, look, like what's the next level, right? How do we become even more efficient at this? Well, then you start using things like Kubernetes, right? I already have Docker, I have these containers. I can use uh, uh, Kubernetes to start uh, doing container orchestration and kind of really making sure that my, I'm using my resources efficiently. I can use something like Chaos Monkey, right, to make sure that I'm provably resilient. So I can start killing random processes and make sure that I don't go down, right? So this is kind of the next level um, of like making sure that you're efficiently auto-scaling. And then finally, there's level five, right? And that's kind of where we want kind of Yoda scale to kind of help you get to level five, right? So there's a lot of things that, can, uh, that, that you need. And if you actually look inside Google, and I'm sure Amazon and Microsoft will be similar, is that they're actually using machine learning. Kind of that next generation of like kind of what's around the corner, things that are happening kind of inside the kitchen, if you will. And a lot of this stuff actually, even at Google, I mean, there's like papers being published and there's gonna be things that are be coming out, which is like inside they're actually using machine learning, right? So there's kind of already startups that are coming out to doing anomaly detection, which is the topic for today, on security, right? If like looking at kind of like system calls and saying, hey, look, these set of system calls coming in this order seems a little bit weird, you could have been hacked, right? And so a lot of this type of techniques are are now actually making their way out into uh, the real world. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that we're doing here at Yoda Scale uh, to help with that. Automate all the things. But how? Let's, let's take a step back, right? What is the ops workflow? So think about kind of just a, a concrete use case of like, you know, you're running, you're running some big you know, website. Um, you know, what do you generally do? You deploy out, you know, there's a system running out there. Uh, you're generating logs, you're generating health checks, like you have a bunch of metrics about CPU and all sorts of stuff, right? That's happening. That's all data, right? I mean, it's just overwhelming amount of data. If you're running at any type of scale, uh, it's just kind of, you know, you can't, there's no human that's sitting there looking at the logs, right? And, and maybe if you can isolate, you know, if there's some problem, if you can get to the box, um, you know, maybe you could do a grep or whatever, but if you have like 100,000 nodes, you're not grepping into any box, right? Finding out where that's happening is just not, it's not happening, right? So you have to kind of figure out a way to turn that uh, data into information, right? And so what do you do? You automate, right? You automate, you say, okay, like when you see these exceptions, you see something like that, like grep, that you've turned it into kind of like you're sucking in all the logs and, you, and you're saying, saying uh, hey, look, if you see an exception, something that looks like this, Start alerting, right? Maybe like you start getting noise. Hey, there's a lot of kind of uh, um, you know noise that's coming in. Like you know some exceptions are just expected, so you get some intelligent, right? You have some thresholding or what ha what have you, right? Uh, so you add some anomaly detection to it. You can like you know there's things that are less severe. You can you can send emails, right? So now you're saying, hey, something is going wrong. You should be looking at it, right? So you turn that data, and ideally in that alert, you have some additional pieces of information, right? You have some context. So it could be like, hey, there's this error that I'm seeing in this cluster. 
with this error message, right? And, and, and maybe if there's an exception, like maybe I'll even show the stack trace so you can actually kind of go back to, uh, back to the code, right? So at that point, when you look at that email, right? Or like look at the alert and kind of click through, now you've turned that, that information to knowledge, right? That you're kind of like, okay, you have this vast amount of data, You've kind of said, okay, now I got to kind of focus in this area, right? Is this cluster with this? I'm looking for this error message. You have some experience of like, okay, generally this error message like indicates this type of problem and this is what I need to be looking for, right? And if you're an experienced ops person, you will be like, oh, okay, I kind of know how to do this. You start deciding what to do, right? Start looking and digging into the root cause, like, well, why did it happen, right? And you're trying to answer that question and you're like, okay, like, you're like, ah, this had no pointer exception, right? I mean, like, uh, Somebody didn't didn't do the check, right? They didn't have the guard for making sure that this uh, that, that this uh, this variable was actually set. Um, so you go file a bug and then you roll back, right? So you have kind of like you figured out what's going on. Uh, so now, with the moment that you're saying, ah, okay, I got this exception. <laughs> it's, a, it's a null pointer exception. You've gotten some insight, right? Now you've figured out what the root cause is. Why why uh, is this is this problem happening? When you got this error spike, um, you've got insight, right? And then you can finally figure out how to, how to remediate. You're like, okay, well, go file a bug. You're, you're the ops person, so maybe maybe in a small company, you're also the dev dev person, right? So DevOps is kind of the uh, kind of also you know kind of a hot new new word. It's not relatively; it's, it's actually a few years old, right? Um, so you know maybe you can go make the change yourself, right? And so it's a pretty simple fix, and you can test it and push it back out. And now you've done your action, right? So so this is kind of the typical cycle. Um, and then you go back, right? They're generating more data and you're kind of going back on the, on the loop. Automate all the things, right? I mean, you're trying to automate, there's a lot of things like the role, think about what you were able to automate in the, in the last, in, in that scenario I described. Well, you had a bunch of data, you're trying to alert, you're trying to say, hey, what's important? That's, that you can automate. Like within that email message, it's like saying, hey, what is the context? Which cluster is it coming from? What that error message is? Where, where, where should I look? Right, taking extracting that, that that exception, sticking into the email message, well, that's easy to automate. The thing that the human had to do then after that is start kind of rummaging around and figuring out, well, okay, what is actually happening? Why? Right, go look at the code. You know, right. I mean, there's so now the human the humans involved. So getting my premise is like it's really hard to get from knowledge to insight. Right, that's where the human has to be involved. Right, and kind of going back that it requires some subject matter expertise. Got to understand the. I mean, I came up with a simple example of the null pointer exception, but there's like things that are more complicated, right? And this is generally the thing that's really hard to do. And then the fix, the rollback, and kind of like you know just being able to roll back or roll forward is often scripted, generally easy to automate, right? So the thing that's hard is this middle section where the human is absolutely required, right? It's like hey, you got to understand what's going on, decide, you got to diagnose, find the root cause. That's hard. Insight requires machine learning. Right, and that's kind of the premise of, the, of, the, of kind of what I was building up to. Right, we have to have machine learning, and not just any machine learning, but it has to be contextual. It has to be kind of uh, talking about kind of understanding the systems that are running in the context of the business. You know, a lot of things that are happening. The advantage that we have actually in this domain, right, in the kind of the systems domain, is that we're actually dealing with structured data, right. And so a lot of things like autonomous driving and visual perception and things like that. I mean, it's not, it's not structured and there's a lot of kind of techniques with deep learning and things like that that, that are required to kind of made that, make that jump. Um, and deep learning can be absolutely useful in our domain as well, but we do have a built-in advantage that we're dealing with structured data. And the more data you have, the more diverse data you have, the better your decisions are, the better your insight's gonna be. The other advantage that we have is that there's actually established pay playbooks, right? So kind of once you identify what's going on, there's generally kind of a playbook, a runbook to say, hey, there's some deterministic kind of follow through that you have to go do. And if you're able to figure it out, uh, kind of what, what, when you need to run it, uh, you know, generally fairly easy to automate the, the, the outcomes, right? And so there's a set of machine learning models that you can use for anomaly detection, root cause, remediation, um, and ultimately you have to kind of understand the context. So, which brings me to what we're doing here at Yoda Scale, right? So, um, so the, what we do is we actually ingest kind of all sorts of information, everything from log files, CPU information, health checks, all that, all of that information I was saying is that kind of data, we ingest it, we put it into our data platform, and we feed it into our machine learning models. 
Now, these machine learning models actually are the things that generate that insight, right? And where we can take automated actions, we will take automated actions, right? So when there are things that, that, that it's like, hey, like this, you know, clearly this maps, this is the reason, this maps here, you can, you can do this, you know, it'll absolutely work. Um, where you cannot automate, now we have some choices, right? So can we identify that there's some optimization that you can do? You're not running your environments as efficiently as you should, right? So, hey, here's a configuration that, that, that we can give you to say, hey, this is a way to optimize your, your environments. Can we do contextual diagnostics saying, hey, look, this is the root cause, right? This is like the code that's causing this error. Or this is the health check. This is the cluster, right? So we go from that kind of sea of data, you have like hundreds of thousands of nodes to kind of here, this is we're shining the spotlight, say this is where you ought to be looking, right? Um, so we can absolutely do that, right? And so, we, but that, again, that's a human involved at the end of it. And then, or we can say, hey, this is a workflow. Generally, when we see this, this is the workflow that kicks off. We generally file a bug, so we can kind of like automatically start generating bugs and things like that, right? So you can open up with a click, click of a button, like a Jira ticket with all of the contextual information filled out, right? And then a human kind of validates and adds additional information or what have you, right? There's, there's a human involved, right? If you could add, automate it, we just go ahead and do it. But if you can't, there's a human involved that has to kind of validate and kind of make sure that, that we, we got it right. And ultimately that gets fed back into the machine learning model so that the models get better. So let's dive into anomaly detection and root cause analysis. So quick definition. Hold on a minute. Uh, the reason that anomaly detection is actually useful for the, in this context is that it's actually a useful way to figuring out when uh, you have actionable information, right? So imagine you have that sea of data, right? There's a ton of it. So when something is not happening, conforming to expected behavior, right? That's what you actually want to be paying attention, right? If everything's running, working well, um, you don't have to do it, right? So anomaly detection as a technique is useful to say, hey, you got something, there's something weird happening you ought to look at. So generally, um, you know, this is going to be kind of with the math. I, I promise it's not actually that difficult to understand. Uh, you know, in, in machine learning, there's generally uh, a notion of uh, objective function, right? And that's actually what you're trying to optimize for, right? So it's often a loss function or an uh, optimization function. But what, this is what you're trying to achieve. Um, in one, of the, one of the ways that you can have a, a, one of the objective functions you can have is an F1 score, right? So you can actually optimize for precision or recall. So precision, just a quick definition, you can't really read it here, which is unfortunate. Uh, maybe I should have made the slide a little bit bigger. But uh, precision is how many of the things that you got right, how many of the things that you called out were right. So like, you know, you said, hey, like, um, there's 10, 10 different anomalies and Five of them were actually anomalies, so you had 50% precision, right? And then, and then recall is saying, of all the anomalies, how many did you catch? So if there were actually 20 anomalies and you only caught five, right, then you, your, your, your recall is actually 25%, right? And so F1 is a mix of those two, so it's two times the precision times recall over the precision plus recall, right? And it's a way of kind of... Uh, kind of making sure that you're accounting for both of them, right? You can, you can actually optimize for one, so you can have precision as your optimization function. You say, hey, look, like, I just want to make sure that I'm not giving you the wrong, the wrong anomaly, right? Meaning that I'm not going to give you noise, right? Which is a perfectly valid thing to kind of say that, hey, if you start kind of telling a bunch of people that, like, this is an anomaly, that's an anomaly, that's an anomaly, like, pretty soon the ops person is going to say, okay, I'm just going to ignore this system because, like, I get woken up too many times and, and, and most of the time it's wrong, right? So if you're optimizing on precision, that's perfectly valid. Um, if, you're, if you're optimizing on recall, well, that could also be valid, right? In kind of a different use case, like, imagine, like, it's cancer or something like that, right? And you're trying to say, hey, off the times that it's cancer, I really, really want to be, I want you to know for sure that this cancer, right? And I'm okay with, sometimes I'm getting a kind of a false call. It's cancer, like that's okay, because I'll deal with it and we'll kind of do subsequent testing and we, we can sort it out. But that first thing, like, you know, this test, better get it right, right? And that's recall. So you, you could decide to do both. We're doing kind of uh, a combination of that. Uh, kind of moving on to kind of machine learning techniques, right? I mean, there are a, a set of supervised, semi-supervised, uh, and unsupervised techniques um, that just depending on how good you are at labeling your data, right? And labeling data is kind of a task in and of itself. And so we're exploring like how we move to some of these techniques kind of in the next generation of what we're building. 
and like I said, there's there's things like uh, there's ne neural net, net net approaches and and traditional conventional ML approaches here that that that, that you can use for uh, for doing anomaly detection. So. I'm going to get to the demo in a bit, but I wanted to kind of show you what the product will do, right? And so, so what the product will do, and you can kind of see it as I dive into the product, uh, into the demo, uh, is you're going to see a time series, right, uh, with your cost, and you're going to see a blue band, right, that shows what the expected value was. And when it falls outside of that range of what we were, hey, we expected... Uh, like, you know, this, the, this very first anomaly to be at a particular point, you can see that it's outside of that blue band, that's an anomaly, right? And we're going to call it out and we're going to say, hey, look, there's something that you ought to be looking at over here. It seemed a little bit lower than we were expecting. Lower maybe doesn't matter, right? You're like, hey, I'm saving some money, <laughs> big deal. On the other side, you see uh, this cost spike and you're like, hey, wait, uh, that actually matters, right? So you have, the, you have this cost spike, uh, this, uh, this is higher than we were expecting. So maybe you want to dive into that. Once you dive into that, you start saying, well, why did it happen? What contributed to uh, the anomaly, right? And so we're going to tell you kind of the, the two or three reasons, kind of the top three reasons generally of what, what, what was the contributing factor of the anomaly itself. which gets us to root cause analysis, right? So now you've, you've identified that there's something going on. There's a, there, 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 you've, we've kind of shown you what the kind of contributing factors were, but why is it happening, right? So now you have to kind of understand the root cause. Uh, and so the root cause, again, I won't read it. I'll let you read it, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the things I've underlined, right? I mean, the, the, the main point is to identify the causality and explain what's going on, right? That's the, that's the thing that a human is doing, right? It's like, hey, like what was actually the true root cause? What was the kind of the the initial incident that that, that, that caused it? What was what was the, the root cause? Look quite literally, and what's the explanation? Like why did that happen? So again, there's a set of uh, techniques that, that are used. Uh, I have here like on the right and kind of very blurry small print. Uh, you know, kind of all the different approaches for doing root cause analysis. It's actually a very rich area of. Uh, of uh, in, um, research, right, in the computer science community. You can find papers actually going back, like, you know, even like 80s and 90s, right? Uh, uh, so a uh, lot of different techniques. Uh, broadly speaking, there's kind of two big f broad families of, of root cause analysis uh, algorithms. Um, there's deterministic and probabilistic. Those were the kind of the, the, the two big techniques. Uh, the, the real difference is that uh, it, with deterministic root cause, there's no uncertainty about what happened underneath, right? So there's that you guaranteed, like, you saw this this failure, like you're not inferring anything. There's no prob uh, there's no probability. Like this happened, you saw this, like these set of events happened in order, right? And so you can say, well, the first event was actually the root cause, right? And, and so so there's there's no uh, uh, confusion there, right? Well, pro pro probable root cause, there's some uncertainty, right? You can infer things, like you can say, okay, this happened, I didn't directly observe it, but I can kind of guess that this happened, right? And you can, uh, um, and, and so, so that gives you kind of like more powerful techniques in, in some cases, but, you know, not really guaranteed. Um, and so, you know, there's different te techniques for deterministic root cause. The one we're using, propositional logic, simply put, it's like, a set of proposals, right? Your propositions, and if you, it's rules, right? It's like if this happens, if this is true, if this is true, if this is true, you know, this is your root cause. If this is true, that's false. If this is true, then that's your root cause, right? So uh, rule-based is, is what, what we're doing today. Uh, we're exploring other techniques kind of going forward. Um, this is kind of still early days, right? I think we, there's a lot we can do, do here. So how does it manifest in the app? So now you've drilled down, right? We found, we found our root cause. Sorry, we found our anomaly, we've identified the contributing factors, we drill down on the contributing factors, um, and then you see, you see the, the root cause analysis here. So kind of this is a summary slide, right, um, to kind of show overall what, what, what Yodascale does. It shows what we are capable of today, kind of what, what, where we're building towards. Um, so we, like I said, we take in a lot of information, cost, CPU, memory, performance, inventory, what's actually running, right? The, the actual kind of inventory of what's running out there. We feed it into our ML pipeline. 
We, do, we run anomaly detection. We run root cause. We're kind of in the process right now of doing prediction as well, so cost prediction. Um, and then ultimately where we want to get to is that remediation, right? It's like, like here's something that's going wrong, right? And then how do you fix it? Um, so you have a set of recommended actions. Um, today, what we can do, like I already showed you, is that, hey, these, this is a diagnostic, so we can either point you to here's the, here's the pool or here's the, uh, the cluster that you ought to be looking at. Um, and in some cases, like, and here's the error code, right, that was, the, that was failing. Like, this is, a, this is the health check that was failing, right? So, again, kind of like taking you from that sea of data to, like, shining the spotlight and narrowing the spotlight to where you ought to be looking. Um, ultimately, we want to do automated remediation. That's the vision of where we want to be going. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, definitely having a recommended workflow or recommended configuration coming out, whether it's Docker or Kubernetes, right? All of this stu stuff should be generated from the ML pipeline. We have an analytics pipeline. I didn't really touch on that in, the, in this product overview, but uh, there's a pretty rich analytics platform underneath as well. So you can slice and dice the data um, and you can actually get a set of recommendations coming out of it to actually optimize, right? So you can do right sizing of like saying that you're over provisioned on certain type of uh, VM or, you, uh, you, 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 know, you have opportunities for RI purchases, you have opportunities to save money because of the way that Amazon deals with, with contracts that you know, you've been running sustained usage for a certain period of time and you can actually uh, save some money by, by reserving an, an instance and getting a 30% discount on that. Or this pool has been running, this cluster has been running at kind of, it's underutilized, right? And it's kind of like 10% capacity. And so, so like you should probably shut this, the, the, this uh, uh, cluster down, right? That could be an opportunity. So there's a whole s set of uh, recommendations that, that, that come with it. So anyway, uh, questions? Are there any questions? That's, that's a sign. Oh, there we go. Good. Yeah. Um, I thought I just did I'm a great job. I'm not a representative. I'm just asking a question. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so in terms of, uh, there, there was one, one of the charts that you showed, or one of the slides that you showed, um, sort of had uh, data coming into the ML models, and then it went. Then you sort of went through. Is it this one? No, not that one. Going back a little bit, right there. Yeah, yeah the machine learning models, um, and then the automation actions. Um, I'm just sort of wondering. Um, I'm assuming that, like, if depending on the number and type of machine learning models that you have. You could probably create um, almost like a expert network um, or a neural net um, where you stack these different models um, for particular functions. Is that something that is, um, is that a valid approach for your use case? So, yeah, I mean, I think we, so that's one of the things that we're looking at, right? So we're doing forecasting right now. One of the things that we're building right now is forecasting, and that can actually, there, there's ways that that can actually feed back into kind of predicting anomalies and things like that, right? So we're, we're kind of very early in talking about that, which is different than neural nets, which is generally kind of like, it is a stack layer, but it's not, uh, it's a little bit more abstract, right? And you kind of have like data coming in and there's some magic happens, a bit of a black box and kind of output coming out and, uh, and there's feedback loops that kind of train it for that objective function, right? And like you don't necessarily know. One of the advantages that we have that actually I didn't talk about in the statistical approach, uh, these bands, right? I mean, that's, I, these, this is actually pretty powerful and pretty useful from an explainability perspective, that you lose that in, if you use kind of neural net te techniques, which may be kind of useful. I mean, this is actually, like I said, a statistical model, and it's actually very, very functional, and it actually does the job. Uh, there may be, it, ha it has kind of shortcomings when you start doing multivariate stuff, and you're trying to understand kind of different things that could be causing anomalies, right, uh, like I said. Um, but just if it's, it's kind of a one time series with cost, I mean, it's actually super effective. Um, but, uh, and the other thing it, it has is explainability is super easy, right? So we have these blue bands and that kind of from a visual perspective right there is like, why is that an anomaly? Well, it's outside of the blue bar, right? And just from a user perspective, that, that's super, super helpful. Sure. Yeah. So what about the fourth uh, anomaly here <laughs> inside the blue bar? <laughs> yes, I was hoping that you didn't catch that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that sometimes, like, uh, I think that there are kind of two different processes that do anomaly detection in the graphics. I think probably diverged in this case, so there's probably maybe some, somewhat of a bug. But yeah, good, good point. Good catch. 
I was kind of trying to gloss over that one the first time I went through it, but I was brought back to the slide. <laughs> What's the bottom chart? Uh, that's just the time, the time period that's, that you're seeing. So that's the, uh, you see the kind of the time, time window, that's the scope uh, in the, in the uh, top chart. So it's the same cost, but this is, that's what it is. Yeah. So I'm also noticing that whenever the bank, whenever it goes outside the anomaly, you try to adjust the band within, say, a certain range, so that if it does reach the same point, it's not an anomaly anymore. But when, as I look further to the right, where the blue band is, yeah, it's really escalating from like the small band. It's, on it's, the wi to, it's widening. It's way. It's much wider. And it's, I, I, and, and that's actually reflecting and kind of the, the moving kind of the moving average that we're using, kind of backwards looking. And so if you look at the variation that's happening in that time period, that's getting reflected in in our expected values changing, right? To say, hey, like I'm seeing variations kind of across the, the, this the, this uh, you know the, this many uh, values. Um, and so that cost, because of that cost is varying by that much, it's reflecting in the in, in that blue band. So it, you know, like imagine. So I mean, this is really kind of the trend analysis. So like imagine, kind of a typical use case is that you you know you're a large enterprise and you're actually moving to the cloud, right? And so generally the uh, the 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 uh, trend in this case is relatively flat, but generally the use case is going to be your cost is actually growing, right? Because you're moving to the cloud, you're bringing in new workloads. Um, and, 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 and so so we have to kind of capture that, right? I mean, just because it's going up does not mean that uh, it's an anomaly. It's actually kind of expected, right? And so so we the way that we manage that is by kind of having this backwards looking part of our function. Uh, and so that, but that does kind of increase when things are kind of went up anom uh, anonymously. Uh, I don't know if I said that correctly, but uh, if you had an anomaly, uh, then you will see this kind of widening of the band. Any other questions? Oh, yes. You did mention this. Uh, so basically, uh, this, let's say I'm using some platform like OpenShift. Sure. So is this something which you would add support to a hybrid cloud platform in future? It's something we're looking at. I mean, one thing that we're actually pretty diligent about is kind of following what our customers need, right? So talking to our customers. Um, right now, I mean, what we're seeing, there's enough, there's enough kind of business in AWS and kind of just, just raw AWS that, that, that uh, is, you know, there's plenty of work to be done there. We're looking at kind of adding multi-cloud support and then, you know, presumably there will be some folks that are also hybrid. And so, uh, you know, I could imagine us getting pulled there, but uh, it's not kind of something that's like kind of immediate in our future. But, you know, we, we do follow the customers. Yeah. I have another uh, sort of related question. Um, in terms of like managed services for, um, for like managed service providers that want to provide um, cost mitigation or, or just cost, like j j just to provide a service to their large customers so that their customers have a handle around their, their costs, because um, you mentioned the large enterprise use case. Is that something that you guys are, are working towards? Or are you like creating a platform and selling it directly for, to the enterprise for them to then deliver the service? Do you understand what I'm asking? Uh, no, I wasn't yeah, like following. Like, yeah, maybe I mean, awesome. Yeah, it's more about, I, I guess is this a model question, right? So, so today we direct, but we do have plans to partner. So it's a channel or managed service providers. Yeah. Right, but it just adds that extra layer, and sure. we just want to make sure because now you have two uh, user personas. Right, one is right. your customer, and one is your MSP. Sure. Right? But in, in, in the roadmap, we have we have plans to support that in the future. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Saving me. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.